introduce some one or two new concepts along the way that are relevant to reverse osmosis. So did anyone here try the problem that was up at the end of the class? Um, if, you, if you did try it, uh, we're, we're going to go through it still. Um, it's worth, uh, worth giving it a go yourself, seeing where you get stuck, and then uh, maybe the solution here will help you. If you didn't get a chance to do it, that's okay. We're going through it here um, in a fairly modern case today. So just a quick recap then from yesterday in terms of reverse osmosis. When we're looking at this monogram here, we're, we don't actually have, like we had in ultrafiltration and in microfiltration, um, a tape building up. So this resistance in the denominator that uh, will counteract the driving force is not, not really present to any extent in reverse osmosis. Um, and we, we, over, we do that in two ways. One is, um, well actually there's multiple ways to get rid of that resistance and ensure that this, this approximation is valid. One way is, of course, to uh, install flocculation and pretreatment in the unit prior to reverse osmosis. That's the most common uh, approach to avoiding any particulate matter from coming into the reverse osmosis membrane and plugging up those pores. These pores are incredibly small. Um, we're, we're really at very, very fine, fine pore size, so we can't afford to limit our resistance by plugging them up with particulate matter. We're already putting such a tremendous delta P in that we get to overcome the reverse, to overcome osmosis, and then just to get through those small pores. So we really want to avoid generating an additional layer of cake to, um, to, to, to then pass through as well. So that's the most common approach is to install upstream filtering and flocculation to get rid of it. But there's some other clever ways of doing that is depending on the, on the nature of the solutes that you're working with, by adjusting the pH, uh, you can uh, encourage that solute to remain in solution rather than precipitate out at the membrane surface. So that's one, one approach. And then other, some solutes are also prone to, uh, to having oxidizing reactions and, and forming salts. And so to avoid <coughs> the membrane entrapment prior to feeding that solute into the membrane. And so that will avoid that solute from oxidizing and forming a cake at the, at the membrane surface. So there's a number of ways to do that as well as just to really keep the fluid moving very fast past that membrane surface to, uh, to complete any build-up there. But the main resistance we face then is the, the membrane resistance itself, and that's um, given by this term here, uh, P sol divided by Ln. So this is the permeability of the sol in the membrane. Uh, so that's a pure property of, of that, of that um, uh, solvent. And then the thickness of the membrane as well. So this is what Hank came back to in his talk. He was saying one of the aims we really look for is to get that membrane as thin as possible, so to minimize that resistance. Um, and that's the that's really why asymmetric membranes took off is because they were able to make them very very thin skin with very very small pore sizes. So it's got a very very thin thickness and, and resistance. But that layer by itself will not be suitable for any form of significant pressure drop, it would simply break. So uh, then the insides is then to have that very porous, open, uh, supporting layer. So that's the way the asymmetric uh, membrane comes from. So the very thin layer is actually doing the work, the larger pores are supporting the membrane, giving it structural and mechanical integrity that allows us then to go to these very large pressure drops, but really still maintain that very thin thickness. Prior to that, membranes had really no practical application on a large scale. So um, then, then the numerator was what we were looking at yesterday was we were looking at equations to derive what delta pi is the, the osmotic, osmotic pressure and uh, we'll see that coming through in the example. So then we have the, the mechanics how to estimate the, the solvent flux. So this is the rate at which the solvent passes through the membrane. But we can also have the rate at which the solute passes through the membrane. Given by the same structure, permeability divided by resistance, or as that term lumped together, sometimes called as permeance, uh, that's much easier to estimate. The permeance, uh, <coughs> the permeance factor then in front multiplied by the driving force, the difference between the concentration at the wall minus the concentration in the permeance. So this is this is important that uh, that concentration is correct. If we've got our membrane over here, we've got some concentration right here at the wall 
And then here in our permeate stream, we've got a much, much lower concentration. And essentially, we're hoping close to zero, in fact, of the salt. So this, this equation is purely looking at the salt flux. And um, what we say is, well, we can't really estimate the wall concentration. If there's even just some slight buildup over here, the wall concentration is going to go up. Um, so what we say is, well, if we assume very well mixed on this side, so essentially very well mixed on the feed side, then the bulk concentration is approximately equal to the wall concentration. That's a really very reasonable assumption that's, that's made. Um, and doesn't lead to significant error in our calculations. Uh, there's, unless you've got known buildup here at the wall that you really can't get rid of, then, then there's going to be an error. In general, this is a very good approximation. Okay, so what we then do is, well, sometimes we can't estimate what the bulk concentration is here exactly other than if we just measure it, but what we'll sometimes do is very crudely assume that the bulk concentration is equal to essentially the feed concentration. That's saying we're feeding this incoming stream to the membrane. So this is my feed side over here. I know that actually my retentate leaving over here, or in other words, the bulk concentration uh, is CB is equal to CR. If I'm introducing this notation, the bulk concentration is essentially the retentate concentration. But what I'm saying is if I really push this material in so rapidly, um, essentially CF is approximately equal to CR. But that's an extremely crude. Um, <coughs> approximation to make. In fact, it, we know that it can't be right. The saying that essentially we haven't done any work with our membrane. All the solids just came in and, and left it again and nothing passed through. So this is just good for back to the envelope calculations. We'll, we'll relax this assumption later on in the class today. Just some more notation here then. Uh, I've called this P solvents, the permeability of the solvents over there. But some books will refer to that as PW, the W referring to water. Um, but there's no, no reason why a solvent must be water. So I tend to prefer P solvent and P salt. And then some other notation that you will also see if you look into the literature around this is that they'll sometimes simplify, for example, P solvent divided by the thickness. That term we said is the permeance. They'll call this A solve. So it's the permeance of the membrane. Uh, the permeance of the solvent through the membrane. So they'll lump those terms together just because we don't know LN, in fact, in, in to a high degree of accuracy. So we'll just lump those together. <coughs> so we'll see if we use that notation as well in the exercises. Okay, any, any questions on this uh, simplified model that we're going to use? Any doubts on what the terms are mean over there and the units? Everyone? We're going to see the units come, come up in the, in the example. So let's take a look at this example. Then, uh, we said we have brackish water, salt water, um, so this would be water sent from the estuary, uh, close by to the ocean, but not, not quite salt water. Pulled up from the ground, so we get brackish water, 1.8% salt, uh, salts, and 25 C, 1,000 psi is fed, is fed to a membrane. Then on the permeate side, we get a good reduction in salt content coming out of the permeate, 0.05 at the same temperature but at a lower pressure. So we established then through some experiments, we mentioned yesterday how we can do this. Uh, we'll see it in the next example as well. We can calculate the permeance of the water. So that's in other words that P salt divided by elements over there on the board over there. The permeance A salt is 1.1 times 10 to the minus 4 kilograms per second per meter squared per atmosphere. The permeance has the bulk of units because it just it, it the units from other bit express flux on, and for J on the left hand side. Um, so that term there, whatever I use for flux is my units divided by pressure. So it has these fairly long bulk of units. That's the permeance for, uh, for solvents and then the salt has its own uh, mass transfer coefficient. So it's, uh, just update your notes a little bit. I, I fixed up the units. They were correct in the original notes, just not expressed in, a, in, a, in an appropriate way. So here the mass transfer coefficient for salt through the membrane is 16 times 10 to the minus 8 meters per second. That refers to this term over here. Flux J salt is equal to the mass transfer coefficient times the 
times the concentration difference. So that's standard from uh, the three end calls from your mass transfer course, is that the plus is equal to the mass transfer coefficient times delta C. So, so that's what that term is. So what I'd like you to do is uh, calculate uh, the, firstly, we'll just simply calculate the um, osmotic pressure on the feed side and on the permeate side. So has anyone got those numbers yet? Just raise your hand, you don't have to tell me. Okay, so let's take the two, three minutes and calculate the osmotic pressure pi on the feed side and pi on the permeate side. That's, that's an important first step to, to, uh, to solving this problem. So I'll give you a minute to do that, a minute or two, and then we'll just compare answers. Okay, so for this Friday tutorial session to be really effective for yourself, you must participate in, and, and work through these calculations. The reason why I pause here is I want you to struggle and figure out what you don't know, so that when you see the solution presented, it makes sense to you. Um, there's no point in just sitting back and like copying off the board what I've done. So just take a minute to estimate what delta, what delta pi is. The reason why that's so important is we're after this J solvent of the solvent is the first part of the question um, and it's going to depend on delta pi. Of the, of the 
salt in the feed, we're told that it's at 1.8 weight percent NaCl. This equation over here, though, is in terms of moles per liter. So it's a molar concentration that we're looking for. So we first just need to convert the 1.8 weight percent over to a molar concentration. So uh, we can do that then by saying it's uh, 1.8 grams NaCl divided by 98.2 grams of water times the molar mass so divided by the molar mass of salt, so 58.5 grams per mole. And then we've got water then the denominator we'll be looking for that in terms of mass, so that's a thousand grams of water per liter. So the con the molar concentration then in the feed is 0.313. Then we can do the same for the permeate, I won't go through the calculations other than just to say C permeate then at 0.05 weight percent is equivalent to 0.00855 moles per liter. So then our uh, delta p, uh, sorry, our delta pi can be calculated from those two concentrations. We can say <coughs> the, the osmotic pressure difference is equal to the Cf minus Cr times R times T. And I'll just put here times A as well. The A there to emphasize the number of ions per mole of salt. So in NaCl we get one mole of sodium, one mole of chloride, so that's A to be equal to two in this case. So if we write this in, then it's 0.313 minus 0 0.0085 5 moles per liter. Times that factor of two, let me just emphasize that here, two moles of ions per mole of NaCl times R times T. So R is 8.2057 so times the minus 5 times the temperature to 98. And then also there's a factor in here to account for the fact that we're, uh, R is expressed in terms of meters cubed, but we've got meters here. Uh, moles per liter, so we need a factor of a thousand then times one thousand to convert liters to meters cubed. So a bit of a, a long expression, I can't fit it all in there. And don't forget that one thousand factor that I've added in. And that gets you a value of 14.89 atmospheres. atmospheres, which is pretty substantial, uh, we won't really be doing anything on that memory. We have to go beyond that to get an effective separation. Okay, so for those of you that have got this down, and uh, one other thing that you can, uh, I'll just put up here, because the units are a bit more good, here is expressed as um, in PSI A, so let's just convert that to atmosphere since we've got atmospheres down here. Um, so delta P is a thousand minus fifty PSI A times the conversion then of atmospheres to PSI. Gets you sixty-four point six atmospheres. 
Okay, and then uh, once you've got that, now you're in a position to calculate the flux of water. Because we've got delta P, we've got delta pi. We're given the flux here of water in, uh, oh, sorry, that's what we need to calculate, and then we're given the permeance of the membrane. So it's, it's a straightforward step to calculate the solvent flux. So just uh, write that down and we'll put in. But if you've got this down already, just go ahead and calculate the solvent flux in L and H. Meters per meter squared per hour. to this uh, expression we're looking for the solvent flux. P solvent divided by L is uh, the permeance that that's given to us is 1.1 times 10 to the minus 4. But it's in kilograms per second per meter squared. Okay, so uh, we can then move on to the next part. I'll give you a few 
minutes to calculate then the salt flux through the network. We've calculated the solvent flux. Uh, let's go ahead and calculate the salt flux. What, what information do we need? Um, and if any, and then just go ahead and calculate. We'll give you a few seconds, a minutes to do that. So the key, the key question for salt flux is on the previous slide, telling us that the salt will move through the membrane at a certain mass flow rate, or mass flux, I should say, of given by P salt divided by L, so that's the permeance of the salt through the membrane. That would be related to the diffusivity of the salt through the membrane, that would be the blood of the salt divided by the thickness of the membrane, times the concentration difference. So CW, the wall concentration, but if we don't have the wall concentration, we would then try to use or approximate that with the bulk con concentration. In this case, we don't even have the bulk concentration. The bulk concentration would be the concentration leaving anti the leucentate. We're not told what that is. We're only, we only know the feed concentration here, CF, we've calculated that as 0.313 moles per, per liter. The concentration in the permeate is calculated down here at 0 0.00855. But we, we're not given enough information to calculate um, the retentate concentration. Even if we do a mass balance, we actually don't have any of our molar flows or, or, or volumetric flows, I should say. Uh, so we can't back calculate from a mass balance you know, what that is. So what we simply say is we're doing a very crude assumption to estimate that salt flux. Um, that's then we are saying we're going to use as a summary of then for the wall concentration or the bulk concentration, we're going to use the feed concentration. So just in this particular crude calculation, we'll use CF for the feed. So then that comes to um, just go back to get that number, 16 times. 10 to the minus 8 is the mass transfer coefficient. Meters per second times this uh, flux, uh, sorry, the concentration difference from 313 minus 0 0.00855. This should take care of the units. This is moles <coughs> of sol per liter solvent. just have to, um, we're looking for this flux now, I would get here, I have unusual units, I meet per second for my mass transfer coefficient, and here I have moles of salt per liter of solvent. Let's just fix that up by uh, multiplying by the solvents. So that's a thousand liters of 
the solvent through the stream, the salt through the stream, the density of water over there. And that then gets me my molar, my molar flux, so I'm just going to use this and add this here. So that gets me a value of 4.87 times 10 to the minus 5 moles per second per meter squared, but I'm going to just then multiply also by the molar mass. And so I'm simply just multiply by the molar mass, just to get cleaner units here, 10.26 grams of salt. So rather than working in moles of salt, it's working grams of salt that's easier to interpret per hour per meter squared. So I've also just taken care of the time units as well. So we'll commonly do this in reverse osmosis because to work on a second basis in SI units and to work on the molar units uh, can be uh, a little hard to interpret the results. So simply convert over to grams and convert over to hours to get more reasonable numbers rather than these small exponentials. So the salt flux here, every hour through our membrane per meter squared we're getting only 10 grams of salt per meter cube. Whereas our volumetric flux was up here, was 19.7 liters per meter squared. Um, so very, very high flux of water through the membrane, very low flux of salt as expected for this membrane is doing what it's supposed to do. So that's what part three is. How do the fluxes compare very low salt content per hour per meter squared relative to the water content per hour per meter squared? Okay, and then um, the rejection coefficient. What is the rejection coefficient defined as? So you may have to go back into your notes to the previous class to get to that.
So what I'm saying is that if you if you if you have switched, uh, if I put water here instead of NaCl, and then obviously NaCl there instead of water, I would calculate an alpha that's smaller than one. So if I if I get to that state, I, I switch switch it around and I recalculate and just recompute. So in this case, what is the mass or molar concentration of salt in the retentate over the water concentration of the retentate? What do I use in the numerator? And that's a value between 40 and 50 
sense. And sometimes lower, sometimes higher than that. Uh, uh, obviously, it's in our favor to try and get that number as high as possible so that we uh, maximize our recovery in a single pass. OK, so here's just a, another example for you to, to think through. Um, we won't have enough time to go through all of it, but we will certainly cover what we can. The questions looking at and, and demonstrating how we can get the permeance is yeah. I just have a quick question. Are you going to be using either cut conversion or recovery so that we don't get to mix that? I'm going to use all three because you'll see all three. Yeah. This is only specific to reverse osmosis, and it's because we don't know what the retentate concentration is. Oh. Yeah, we're making a very critical okay. assumption out here. Yes, we're making that assumption. It's not normally true. So, so let's let's uh, let's stress that because this is this is important to understand. In the absence of better information. Uh, well, let's, let's take a look at what we should be doing. So should, for the recovery. Sorry? <coughs> for the recovery, for yeah. the rejection. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so here you're referring to this term here where we should be using the retentates. Oh, the, the beta. The new term. The new term. Okay. So that's the feed. That's the feed. No, these are flows. These are flows. Okay. Yeah. So the recovery doesn't depend on. Okay, I see what the issue is. So the recovery is purely a, it's just a ratio of the flow rates. It's the ratio of the flow rate leaving in the permeates over the, uh, the feed. And we want this to be as high as possible and because we're interested in that permeate stream. That's our, our stream that we're more than likely going to use. It's the pure, clean solvent stream and we want that to be as high as possible. So in this example, uh, we've got a lab set up where for a given area of membrane and given salt concentrations, we're mixing it so well on the feed side that essentially it's leaving at the same strength. So there's, your, there's the ground for which you can make the assumption my feed concentration is equal to my retentate concentration. That's normally not true, especially for microfiltration and ultrafiltration. But in reverse osmosis, uh, for, for very crude calculations, we can make this uh, assumption. Then we're given our permeate concentration. That's easily measured, grams of salt per meter cubed. And we can measure the flux of the permeate. 1.92 times 10 to minus 8 meters cubed per second. That is the flux of the solvent or salt. One point nine two ten to the minus eight. J, or J, uh, J salt or J salt? Salt or salt? The units help you again. The units guide you. The units are in volumetric per second, so it's, it's the solvents flow. It's the permeates flux, so it's the volume of solvents per uh, per second coming out in the permeate. So that's the solvents. Uh, flux, we've then essentially been given this information that we need here, J salt, the volumetric flow rate of the solvent through the membrane. We're given information on the pressure, and then we've given enough information there to calculate delta pi. So I'm not going to go through the numerics of this question, let's just go through the conceptual approach. You can do the numbers yourself. Um, in the remaining time that we have, we don't have enough time to go through the numbers. But what we're after in this question is to calculate the permeance of the of the stand, of the solvent through the membrane. So in other words, we're wanting to calculate this ratio, P sol divided by L, we're going to lump those together, and we're going to calculate that by setting it equal to the solvent's flux, which we're given, divided through by this term over there, the pressure difference minus the osmotic pressure difference. So we're given enough information then to calculate that. There's my delta P, 54.42, my capital delta P from the, this salt concentration in the permeate 
and the salt concentration in the feed, I've got enough information to calculate the osmotic pressures, so I can calculate delta pi. And I'm given that 1.92 10 to the minus 8, that's my J salt. So there's enough information there to calculate the limits. Uh, divide that by the area? by the membrane area, that's right. So the flux J is 1.92 times 10 to the minus 8 meters cubed per second per meter squared. Take, just take care of that by dividing through by the small membrane area of 20 centimeters per square. So it's a very small lab, lab size membrane. So take 1.92 10 to the minus 8 divided by 2 times 10 to the minus 3. That gets you a flux of solvents. That's your left hand side. And your right hand side, we've got delta P and we've got delta pi. We can calculate the permanence. So that's the first part of this question. Calculate the permanence constant for the solvent. The permanence constant for the salt, or in other words, the mass transfer coefficient is we're after calculating that combined ratio of the depth. That would require us to know the salt flux multiplied by the concentration difference. <coughs> we know the concentration difference. We're told what those concentrations are. But here's the key new piece of information you need to get from this class today. Is if we do a mass balance over the, over the membrane, so here's my membrane over here. And this is my feed side, this is my permeate side. J solvent, the flux of solvent through the membrane that's coming from the feed side to the permeate side is given to me. J salt is the mass flow of salt in the feed that's going to pass through the membrane and leave it in the permeate side. So J salt is going to have units of kilograms of salt per meter squared per second. That's my mass of salt per, per unit area, per, per unit time, passing through the membrane, leaving out in the permeate. If I take the concentration Cp over here, the concentration of salt on the permeate side, and I multiply it by the salt concentration, I can set that equal to J salt. This is a simple mass balance. Mass of salt into the membrane is equal to the mass of salt leaving in the permeate stream. There's no accumulation of salt in the membrane at steady state. So we can say J salt is equal to J solvent times CP. So, and to convince you of that mass balance, uh, what, what's helpful is to look at the units. <coughs> the units are as follows. This is meters cubed of solvent per meter squared per second multiplied by the concentration of salt in the permeate stream. That's given the units of kilograms of salt per meters cubed of solvent. There, this cancels out, and we're seeing that J solvent times CP is the mass flow of kilograms of salt per unit time per meter squared. J salt, then, which we set equal to this term over here, up on the board, is equal to those same units, kilograms of salt per meter squared per unit time. So the units of balance, this mass balance makes sense. Okay. So from that, then we can go to the next step and help with the permanence of the salt. So I encourage you to do that as an exercise and you will in fact do it in the